He claimed that the only knockdown in his career in the fight against Juan Roldan was due to the fact that he slipped. During his professional career, Marvin spent 67 fights, scoring 62 victories, 52 of which were predominantly by knockout, suffered three losses and two draws. Hagler made 12 successful defenses over more than five years, racked up 11 knockout victories, and also won the IBF title along the way. Today, I propose to recall the best fights and the life path of boxing legend Marvelous Marvin Hagler. I am the middleweight king and nobody's taking nothing away from me. And that I mean. Marvelous Marvin Hagler is one of the incredible four, which includes such boxing legends as Roberto Duran, Sugar Ray Leonard, and Thomas Hearns. All these great boxers met each other in the 70s and 80s of the last century. And many of these fights have forever entered the treasury of the best fights in the history of boxing. Marvin Hagler is considered by many experts, analysts, journalists, and ordinary boxing fans to be among the greatest fighters of all time, and within his native middleweight category, some rank Marvelous as the first line among the best boxers in history. Marvin Hagler was born on May 23, 1954, in Newark, New Jersey. He grew up in a large family without a father, consisting of nine children. The family lived in a rented apartment in a non-prestigious old part of the city. Shortly after the infamous race riots that rocked Newark in the summer of 1967 and personally affected 13-year-old Hagler as the family's rented apartment was destroyed in the riots, Marvin's mother, Ida May, decided to move the children to Brockton, Massachusetts, where her sister lived. Thus, since 1969, Marvin settled in the city where one of the greatest heavyweights in the history of boxing, Rocky Marciano, was born and lived. As we now know, fate would have it that Brockton raised another legendary fistfighter of Marvin Hagler. Knowing all the charms of fatherlessness and poverty, Marvin left school at the age of 15, and shortly after that, his son Champ was born. To feed his son and common-law wife, the then underage Hagler had to not only work at construction sites, but even engage in petty street theft. According to Marvin, doing this, he had to run a lot and get a little. But one day, 16-year-old Marvin, who was hitting the bag in the boxing hall, was noticed by local coach Goody Petronelli. Looking closely at the blows and movements of the teenager, he said that Marvin acts naturally. Hagler later admitted that he took this remark not as a compliment, but as a statement that he boxed primitively. Marvelous, you moved to Brockton, Massachusetts when you were 15 years old, and soon after you were there for a while, you started working out under the guidance of the Petronelli brothers. As a young boxer, how did you go about developing your skills? What was your style? Well, you know, actually, I think from just street fighting, I didn't really have a style at the time. Um, by coming into the gym, I just had natural ability. And uh, I never really knew what natural ability was. And my trainer just told me to go in the ring and just, just fight as if I was going to fight in the street. And then after that, he started teaching <laughs> me how to develop, you know, where, where the punches would go. I didn't even know my right from my left. And then <laughs> throw the right at me, the left hand, you know, until I had to start concentrating on my right hand, my left hand. But under the guidance of Goody and his brother Pat Petronelli, Marvin was able to quickly make progress in the ring. The acquaintance of the Petronelli brothers and Hagler took place in 1970, and already in May 1973, Marvin won the national AAU 165-pound title. On the way to this victory, Hagler won four fights, including two by knockouts, and was recognized as the most technical boxer of the tournament. Hagler subsequently turned professional, finishing his amateur career with a 55-1 record. For the first professional fight, which took place on May 18, 1973, in which he knocked out Terry Ryan in the second round, Hagler earned only $50. Years later, Marvin admitted that when he turned pro, he did not think about high-profile victories and great achievements. At first, he only wanted to earn money in order to simply live comfortably. 
Undefeated in his first 26 pro fights, only one of which he drew, ending the vast majority of fights ahead of schedule, in January 1976 in Philadelphia, Hagler lost in a fairly close fight in 10 rounds by a majority decision to local fighter Bobby Watts. And two months later, after one more fight, in the same place and also on points in 10 rounds, Marvin lost to another Philadelphian, Willie Monroe. Later, he convincingly rematches with his offenders, and over the next few years, entering the ring very often, Hagler will continue to defeat all his opponents, including the 1972 Olympic gold medalist Sugar Ray Seals, with whom at the beginning of his pro career brought the fight to a draw. But Marvin continued to hope for a chance to compete for a title shot. Officials of the leading boxing organizations and influential promoters preferred not to notice the talented powerful contender and many strong fighters of that time simply did not want to go into the ring with Hagler. The Petronelli brothers, unfortunately, didn't have enough influence of their own to bring their ward to the championship fight. This was not immediately helped by the signing of Hagler's contract with Bob Arum, who was beginning his promotional activities at that time, a competent lawyer who had previously worked even in the U.S. presidential administration under John F. Kennedy. The fact that it took you so long to get a title shot, do you think it made you hungrier, meaner? Uh, it did. I think it made me meaner. And behind the fact that um, me still being in a poor area, helping my mother out with my younger brothers and sisters, you know, that, that tendency to put that hunger in, in the, uh, your mouth. And also from the environment, for me coming up from New Jersey. Uh, I think that's what made me meet him, knowing that the only way to make it to the top is you got to knock everybody out. About the fact that he was not allowed to fight for the world title for a long time, Hagler spoke in an interview with Sports Illustrated magazine in 1978 as follows. Joe Frazier once told me that there are three reasons for my being ignored. I'm left-handed, I'm black, and I can punch. Maybe I should have been born right-handed and a white woman. But in November 1979, Marvin finally fought for the world title for the first time. He was opposed by the Italian-American Vito Antofermo, who at that time owned both belts of the main boxing organizations WBC and WBA, who was a tough, physically strong, and dirty fighter. Following the results of 15 rounds of stubborn struggle, the fight ended in a draw. Most boxing experts and fans believed that Hagler had done enough to win, but two of the three side judges were of a different opinion. The relative failure did nothing to break Marvin. Less than a year later, in September 1980, having previously won the status of a mandatory contender, Hagler went into fight against Britton Allen Minter, who by that time had taken the championship titles from Antuo Fermo. I thought I won the fight. I thought Antuo Fermo should have gave me another fight right after that, another title fight, and instead he fought Allen Minter. And this is a guy from England. Um, I felt as though that um, that fight should never took place, so it, it made me even bitter. I went back to work. I think I knocked out about three or four different guys to put myself in that position of fighting for the title where they could not deny me mm -hmm. a shot at the title. Then I went to London, England to fight this guy, Alimenta. So I had that kind of thing of, I cannot let this guy stand. It's like, I gotta kill him. So that's the third one that's appeared. A trip to London and a performance at the famous Wembley left a double impression on Marvin. Having their hand, the public, brutalized after the devastating defeat of the local boxer, began to throw glasses, bottles, and everything that came to hand towards Marvin. Hagler could not even immediately get the one championship belts because he was forced, together with his seconds, under the cover of the police, to simply flee from the ring. From that moment began a magnificent long series of successful defenses by Marvin of the title of absolute world champion. Beginning with the fight against Venezuelan Fulgencio Abelmigias, which took place in January 1981, for more than five years, Hagler had 12 successful defenses of his championship belts. And only once out of the mentioned 12 fights did Marvin's opponent manage to reach the final gong. 
Among the defeated opponents was Vito Antuofermo, from whom Marvin took a convincing revenge for a draw that did not allow him to become a world champion back in 1979. You better get your popcorn and your beers and find your seat real quick because this fight don't necessarily have to go 12 rounds because I'm out there to rip his head off. I got H-U-R-T written in my mind. That means I'm going to destruct and destroy. During the preparation of the fight, Hagler, wherever he appeared, promised to swat him like a fly with a fly swatter, crush Antuofermo like an insect. Antuofermo, however, was not an insect. Rather, he was a tough, durable, and fearless competitor. At his best, Antuofermo used his arms, elbows, and shoulders to get close to his opponent, where, with short blows and steady pressure, he would tip the balance of power. His fighting style did not bring many knockouts, and his relentless aggression in the ring exacerbated his biggest flaw, the thin, thin skin around his eyes. Serious cuts led to his first loss against Harold Weston, and even with the win, he still looked like he just visited a slaughterhouse. Controversial, experts considered that Hagler was robbed by the judges. Hagler did everything to fulfill this promise, knocking out the next four or five opponents. Only one fight during this period came to a decision of the judges in his favor. And now, a year and two months later, the opportunity came to refight between Marvin Hagler and Vito Antuofermo. The most popular prediction for the fight with Hagler was that if the challenger did not stop Antuofermo, then the champion would lose the titles due to injuries. June 13, 1981 experts predictions came true, their confrontation took place. Obviously, Anthony Fromo has to be very conscious, and there's a left-hander shot. And again, Vlad showing. At this juncture of the fight, you would have to say that it's Marvin Hagler's fight. Regardless. Many years ago, the second Sugar Ray Rock under the right eye, actually. First. And then, of course, the blood and My mother still wants me to be a doctor. Not too late. As a result, Hagler was awarded the victory by technical knockout due to a cut in Antuo Fermo after the fourth round. Then the strong Syrian Mustafa Hamshow was stopped. Fulgencio Abelmigias was beaten again. Caveman Lee, Tony Sipson, and Wilfred Sipian were torn to pieces. But then he puts him in his place again, Hagler, doesn't he? What a, what a workman. Oh. I believe that I want to prove to the world that I am one of the greatest. I think Monzon was the last great middleweight champion. And when I'm done with this game, I would like to go down in history as the same way. Marvin Hagler is a boxer who rightfully deserves great attention and fame. Many of his fights were difficult and spectacular. In November 1983, Hagler fought the legendary Panamanian Roberto Duran. The fight was very difficult, given that the opponent in the past was the world champion in two weight categories at once and, in addition, realizing that he could not compete with Marvin in a power confrontation, he chose a very interesting tactic, a counterattacking manner. And I must say that Hagler was not quite ready for this. Less than a minute to go. Hagler with a left to the head. Hagler with a right to the hand that rocked the land. The ran with a right uppercut. Uh, he'll be very effective. A right to the body by Duran, but he paid it. Hagler uh, fought several rounds. They trade body shots. Hagler with a left hook to the head. Comes out Hagler. winging. And he came out right at the end of this fight. I think that the Hagler... Based on the judges' notes, if this 15-round fight had been a 12-round fight, Duran would have come out victorious. But in the end, Marvin pulled himself together, had a good three final rounds, and eventually won by a very close but unanimous decision. In the spring of 1984, the reigning world champion met in a fight with the assertive Argentine Juan Domingo Roldan, in which, for the only time in his pro career, Hagler was counted down, which, however, was rather doubtful. As a result, the relentless angry Marvin ended that fight ahead of schedule in the 10th round.
I realize now what they want to see. Every championship fight, they want to see a knockout. They want to see somebody knocked down. They want to see somebody beat up. So, hey, they're talking to Marvin Hagler. They're talking to the right man. Mustafa Hamshill was given a rematch, but the Syrian was again TKO'd, this time in only three rounds. Hamshill angered Hagler with a trio of intentional headbutts in the second round and a fourth early in the third, goading the normally patient and cautious Hagler into a full-out attack that left Hamshill battered and defenseless in a matter of seconds. That's what I feel. War. That's what's on my mind. I've been feeding the faith and I've been starving the doubt. So there's no doubt in my mind that I can't win this fight or that I won't knock Thomas Hearns out. Eight minutes of rage, this is how they dubbed one of the most brutal battles in the history of boxing, which was presented to the world in the spring of 1985 by Thomas Hearns and Marvin Hagler. The fight could have taken place two years earlier, but fell through due to the fact that Hitman injured his right hand. Since then, this injury to the strongest hand, the most terrible weapon of Thomas, bothered him systematically and aggravated during periods of training. The fight was postponed, however, Thomas stubbornly insisted that it take place on his territory in Detroit. Hagler did not agree to this, and the fight fell through. Now their battle was fueled by much greater public interest. Bob Arum paid enough attention to promotion, holding several photo shoots, meetings, and conferences. People keep asking why I fight Marvin. Marvin is terrible, Marvin is Superman, Marvin is God. But he is the only one who will fight me. Held in April 1985, the duel with another boxing legend, Thomas Hearns, is recognized as one of the most brutal and exciting fights in the history of boxing. I'm kind of tired of all this talking and everything. I'm just going to tell you this. I'm going to knock him out. That's all it is to it, and that's the bottom line. I'm going to knock him out, and he will not be the beast no more. And this man, I will end his career for him. Marvin's last successful defense was a fight against a hitherto unbeaten, very powerful, and extremely tough prospect from Uganda, John Mugabe, nicknamed the Beast, who finished all his 25 pro fights ahead of schedule before the fight with Hagler. In a double-edged, brutal and dynamic fight, Marvin simply destroyed an ambitious prospect in less than 11 rounds. This was the first defeat in Mugabe's career, moreover, after such a fight he could no longer reach his previous level. The famous ex-champ Sugar Ray Leonard was present at the fight between Hagler and Mugabe. The topic of his potential meeting with Marvin had been discussed periodically over the past years, but now Sugar was extremely determined. Hagler held his last fight on April 6, 1987 against, perhaps, the brightest superstar of that time, Sugar Ray Leonard, who had a three-year break in the ring before that. In the eyes of the public, Leonard was the face of boxing, the epitome of success and goodwill. He had what Marvin lacked so much, the recognition of the masses. By the beginning of 1987, Marvin had already 37 fights, which, with the exception of the first two, ended in brilliant victories. The reigning world champion prepared carefully for his meeting in the ring with the legendary Ray Leonardo. He was the unconditional favorite in bookmakers. All bets were mainly on him. The long-awaited meeting of the two boxers took place on April 6, 1987. Throughout the fight, Hagler tried to understand his opponent's tactics. But while Marvin swayed and calculated the opponent, moving easily and quickly and inflicting a series of machine gun light blows, Leonard came off in points at the end of the first half of the battle. And when Hagler found the rhythm, he simply did not have a few rounds to win this meeting. In the end, Marvin lost by split decision. It should be said right away that disputes about the victory of Leonardo periodically arise to this day. So, many boxing fans are convinced that the world title was awarded to Ray by mistake. In my heart, I am still a champion. I hate the fact that they took the victory from me. 
In a split decision, it is given to the champion, not to the challenger. There's a lot of politics in boxing, it makes me sick. Marvin took the defeat extremely hard and in many of his interviews compared the enemy to a rabbit running away at the first danger. After this fight, Hagler made the final decision to leave the big sport, especially since Leonardo categorically refused a rematch. I didn't really feel like I lost. My losses were an experience, they put a lot of hatred into my actions in the ring. I think Leonard looked at my record and said, Hagler, forget it, man. Do you think I'm crazy? If the result of the fight was reversed, I would give him a rematch, because such an act shows a champion. After leaving the sport, Marvin at one time began to abuse alcohol, as a result of which his wife, having taken all the children, left him. In 1990, their official divorce took place. Two years later, Hagler left the United States of America and went to live in the Italian city of Milan. Here he made a living by taking part in commercials, in addition, starred in five films. In 2000, pleasant changes took place in Marvin's personal life, the Italian Cade became his wife. The former world champion, on average, led a very measured and quiet life. Together with his wife, he spent most of his time in Italy, but did not forget to regularly visit America, the city of Bartlett, which meant so much to Hagler. According to the boxer himself, he was pretty tired after all the years of grueling training, endless fights and constant restrictions. Living by the rules of others has extremely exhausted Marvin, and now he enjoys peace and quiet. I just want to be remembered as one of the best. Not necessarily the greatest, but one of the best. Give the kids something to imitate me. This is not to say that Hagler was too public after the end of his career. For example, he did not commentate on almost every top fight, as Andre Ward or Lennox Lewis often do. Marvin devoted most of his time to his family. Probably, it was precisely because of such a secluded lifestyle that the news of his death became a bolt from the blue. On March 13, 2021, Hagler's wife, Kay, announced that he had died of natural causes at his New Hampshire home at the age of 66. His son James said his father was taken to a New Hampshire hospital due to chest pains and difficulty breathing. Marvin Hagler's boxing has always pleased the viewer. It was spectacular, although not always. Unfortunately, it ended in his victory. Marvin Hagler is rightfully considered the best middleweight boxer in the history of boxing. Sleep tight, champ. And still.